Hey everybody, welcome to the series on Curse of Strahd uh, for Shadow Dark RPG. Um, I am now two sessions into a Shadow Dark version of Curse of Strahd, which I'm calling Legacy of Strahd. It's my take on the 5e adventure. And I wanted to go through it. I think it'll be fun to do some prep while talking about it. And I figured if I'm doing that, I might as well put it up on YouTube. So we'll see how that goes. Um, I think in this video, what I'm going to do is go through some of the early prep that I did before our session zero. Um, we've had a session zero and we've had our first session and we're going to have our second session in a couple days. And I wanted to just go through some of the, again, prep work that I did in getting Curse of Strahd, shifted over sort of the groundwork that I did, what I wanted from the campaign, and then what I prepared before session zero. Um, so on the left here, I have my player handout for Legacy of Strahd. Um, with a little brief, you know, caption at the top, and then um, going right into it, basically. So I don't have what I don't have on this are the classes that I used. Now, if you're familiar with Shadow Dark RPG, you'll know that there are four base classes: um, Fighter, Thief, Wizard, and Priest. And I kept all four of those, but I also added in a few more. I added in the uh, the Beast, which is a class I found online. It's sort of like a werewolf. Um, the idea is you, you're normal, pretty weak human. You don't have a lot of abilities until you go to zero hit points. And then instead of dying, you come back to full hit points as this really powerful monster. And then in order to get out of that form, you kind of have to like eat the corpse of a creature. So you have to like, you know, you, you kind of become a beast. And then you stay in that form until you either die or until you uh, find a way to kind of get out of it by, by consuming a, a, a creature to eat. And then, um, so that's one of the classes I added, was the Beast. And then I added the Curse Knight from Curse Scroll 1, which was well, the zine that accompanied the Shadow Dark RPG from the Curse Library, or from the Arcane Library, excuse me. And then I added in the Seer, which is, I think, the third uh, Curse Scroll zine. Um, it's Norse in tone, but I reflavored it for to be a Vistani, who are kind of like the Romani folk in Barovia in the campaign. And then I add, also added in the Plague Doctor from Unnatural Selection, I think. I think it came from there. I'm, I'm not sure, but I think it did. And, and those, are the, those are the class options, so quite a few. Um, oh, and then I had the Bard and the Ranger as well from, from that. Uh, so along with those, uh, this is a human-only campaign. I wanted Gothic Horror, right? I wanted Gothic Horror to be kind of the base of it, and so I, when, whenever dwarves and elves and halflings show up, <laughs> goblins, half-orcs, all of that, it just takes you right to uh, high fantasy. Maybe, you know, a sword and sorcery or something like that, but it certainly doesn't taste like Gothic Horror to me. So I just made this human-only, and the players were totally fine with that. They, they were like, yeah, that's fine. So um, first off, the setting. So I found this awesome map online, um, and I wanted to I wanted to use it as the basis of my campaign. It's obviously sort of an expanded version of the map from Curse of Strahd and uh, from other you know from Ravenloft and Van Richten's Guide and stuff like that. So, uh, but it's an expanded one. I think it was in Polish originally, and here it is uh, as a translation. I, I don't know who to give credit to for this because I found it as I was searching and I, I, it was posted to some forum and I just stole it because it's awesome. <laughs> I think it's a really, really cool map. Um, so I, I, again, I don't know who to give credit to for this. But it's just really cool and you can see that like the detail on this thing is incredible. It really is good. So I, I thought this fit perfectly for my vision of Barovia in this world because I don't want Barovia to be... In this world, I don't want it to be a demi-plane separated out, 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 you know, in the in the the Shadowfell or whatever. I didn't want that. Um, I wanted it to be a province in the world, and I and I also didn't want Strahd to be to start the game alive. I want Strahd to have to be dead. The sort of the background of this world is that in my world is that Strahd, very similar to Count Dracula, right? That from the the northwest of, of Barovia, there are these great step steps. And the Crusade of the Three Paradises, that's the translation, right? These sort of this holy, this holy covenant of three different religions or three different visions of of their religion or whatever it might be, kind of came on this crusade, uh, this holy war, and um, that Barovia was on sort of like again like uh, against the uh, uh, Transylvania with the Ottomans, right? The Ottoman Empire in the Middle Ages. 
Uh, I, th- I sort of see Barovia in that light. Uh, obviously, that's where it takes its in- inspiration from. So Barovia was sort of caught in this middle ground, and uh, Strahd was a the, 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 you know count during that time, and he you know helped protect his people and all this stuff. So uh, it's sort of set in the world, and then he became this creature. I'll talk more about that in another video. I think when I talk more about what I did with Strahd himself to change it, but. He became this creature and ruled for a while, but because there was that war going on and because there was all these, you know, stories of how the, what the Horde did and how horrible it was and vice versa, what they, you know, what the defenders did to them when they got them, just, you know, all the horrors of war, that the stories of this creature were thought to just be exaggerations. But in fact, he was this horrific, you know, blood-sucking vampire. <laughs> and then he was a tyrant. And after the horde had been driven out, he ruled still for several years, uh, you know, taking it out on his people, so to speak, in the chaos that, that followed before he was slain by some heroes. Um, and he has been dead all this time, but kind of waiting to return. And so uh, my game, my Curse of Strahd, that's why I call it Legacy of Strahd, is that he is, his shadow is sort of hovering over Barovia, and he's going to be visit, visible in dreams, and he's going to, you know, his shadow will be seen stretching out across the land. Sometimes, you know, maybe not physically, but, the you know. And uh, and there's a cult led by Rahadin, or Rahadin, I forget how to say his, I don't know how to say his name, but he's the, uh, the dusk elf in the book, Curse of Strahd. I'm not going to make him an elf, but he is going to be this necromancer who is seeking the secret to eternal life. And he wants to raise Strahd because he knows that he had this, you know, sort of immortality in the, in the old texts. He knows sort of that what he was. So he wants to raise his spirits so that he can learn the secret and become a vampire himself. Sort of like that. So Barovia is under this curse as the spirit of Strahd is returning. And uh, so that's, that's my kind of background. So anyway, um, it's part of the world, in other words. <laughs> and I, like, I think this map does a good job of, of showing that. Okay, um, so let's see. Go back to my session zero notes here. So that was sort of the background. The players didn't really know that. I did tell them a couple things. So in my game, there are firearms, but they're very basic. Uh, pistols and you know, rifles, muskets. They have a misfire chance. It's pretty high, especially when it's damp. So I have sort of like flint locks. Um, really basic guns. And, you know, obviously there's anachronisms and it's a fantasy world. Uh, but... I'm kind of thinking 1600s, 1700s, maybe very end of the 1700s. Um, and again, there's anachronisms, but you know, there's lanterns and guns, um, carriages. It's not steampunk. I didn't want to go that direction at all. But gothic horror, right? 17th century, 18th century, maybe early, early 19th century in tone, right? And in, in, in things like that. But that, but I'm, I'm going for that view of things. Um, okay, so before session zero, I gave my players um, just sort of like a, I gave my players a sort of way of um, uh, getting into things beforehand. Um, and we had a, a really good productive session zero. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to do was they're all, you know, pretty good, uh, pretty experienced role players at this point. One of the, one of my players has been playing since the '70s, or he, he started playing back in the '70s and '80s, and uh, really hasn't. He didn't play for a long time, and now he's kind of getting back into the, the hobby. A couple of my players have, um, or one of my other players has been around since the beginning of 5e, pretty much. And then the other two are much more recent, in maybe that they started three years ago or so. Pretty recent players, but they've all been playing for some time. They've all played in multiple campaigns by this point. So um, I, I, I didn't worry about them, and, and they've all played together. Not in a really big campaign, but they were part of my West Marches that I did, so they've all played sessions, just the four of them. And uh, they are all great role players, and they're just great players generally. So I wasn't worried so much about them not creating a party that would function. I knew that they would do it, but I wanted to give them help. And I wanted to give them concrete help during our session zero. So I created these roles. It's also a help to me. Basically, these are sort of, as you can see, archetypes, sort of, and they're influenced, obviously, by gothic horror, but there's Darkest Dungeon in there, too. Um, and, and kind of the idea was, these aren't backgrounds, these aren't classes, these aren't, um, like, pre-made characters. Rather, it's just this. This was the full extent of it, a description with a name. And just as a way of kind of fitting yourself into the world and into the story, because I had ideas for how to connect these to the main story that's happening 
throughout Barovia, the main events, the other characters that I had already been thinking of, the NPCs and things, and what they want. Uh, and I, these were like hooks, right? You can pick one of these and you'll be tied right into other things that I've already been doing, that I've been working on in the background. And I think the players really liked it. And so far it's working out well. I haven't, we've only played one full session, but it's worked out well so far. Um, so I had these roles to pick and uh, my players were, they, they paid me the ultimate compliment. One of my players said, uh, the problem with these is that they're all interesting and I want to pick them all. And so that's cool. That was really cool. And then number 10 was just a kind of a catch-all. If you, if you didn't want to do that, if you wanted to really make a character who was kind of unique and did his own thing and didn't have any of these connections, just pick number 10. And you're an unknown, you have no connections, you're just kind of, you can, you know, make your own story. But no one picked that. Um, the four that my, my, my players picked were the Antiquarian. Um, uh, one of my players picked that. She really liked it. She wanted that book, and she's tied it into her character really well in a cool way. Another one of my characters picked The Descendant. My players picked The Descendant, and that's also really cool because, um, well, in my story, which I'll go into more in, in another video, I think, uh, it's the line of the hero that kind of is important to the cult. They want to get it. So <laughs> it's cool that somebody picked that because there's a cult. Uh, yeah, obviously, as I said, under Rahad. Then uh, one of my other players picked the innocent, which is cool because that person is, you know, was about to be sacrificed. They were rescued by the other players, and so they have like a really, you know, personal connection to this. They were almost killed, and and that player also kind of had his his character's brother be another person who had been captured and had disappeared. So he's looking for him, and that's kind of what happened. So there's there's a again a personal connection into the the cult and and to stopping it. And then finally, the last character, my last player, picked the redeemed. And that worked really well because he said that he was part of the cult as we were kind of figuring out all of these connections. Um, now, they don't know exactly what the cult wants. They don't know exactly uh, what the cult is doing or who's leading it. Um, I gave them a little information. I gave more to that character, that player, uh, who picked that. Um, he knows a little more, and he shared it like almost immediately in the first session. He shared what he knew. So they all kind of have uh, the same information, which isn't much. But uh, his character is really cool because he's, he also picked the beast as a class and so he has this curse uh, that he was kind of going to the cult to help him with and and they sort of promised him salvation right uh, a chance to use this curse as a gift and to see it differently but then he realized they had been misleading him or lying to him and that really they were just evil evil right and so he resists this this curse he resists this beast inside him and and chooses to help and so he tries to rescue them or he succeeds in rescuing the, the other character and that's how the kind of the party all came together was the antiquarian's book had been stolen by the, the cult uh, because they needed it for their rituals they wanted it for their rituals and so she went to get it back and she did but the, the ritual that they were using it for was the sacrifice of the innocent whose whose cousin we decided the descendant was that so kind of also ties the innocent into that bloodline so that's cool but the, the, his cousin was there to rescue him meanwhile the one of the cultists, the other player, the redeemed, switched sides. And so the four of them kind of, this was all in the background. It was in session zero. So we just described like scenes and like kind of talked about, well, I imagine this sort of thing happened and that sort of thing happened. And you probably had this like, oh, moment and that. So it was really cool where they kind of got to do a little bit of like, you know, prelude or um, chapter zero stuff, uh, you know, uh, prologue stuff. And, uh, and then one of my characters kind of wrote up scenes from that prologue. It was really cool. She was... Uh, really into it. So it was really, really cool that these four characters, these four players, I think had these roles because it let them tie the classes also that they were picking. Um, so the the player who had the Antiquarian, she picked the Cursed Knight, so she's cursed by the book itself, and so she has this connection to it, which is why she can't let them have it. Not only will they use it for evil, but it's kind of powering her, and she doesn't know exactly what it's doing, and so she wants to know more. So she's curious, she's horrified, She's trying to protect it, but she's also maybe a little bit, maybe I could use this a bit more. So it's it's kind of a cool character to have the combination. So these roles really fit with the classes. The players came together in a really great way. And then there were backgrounds that they were able to pick, um, which they just kind of added in. Now, it's Shadow Dark backgrounds are a little bit like your, your skill selection. <clears throat> You're going to get advantage on skill checks that are related to them or ability checks that are related to your background. And, and it was another thing for the players to do to kind of put the finishing touches on their character in their mind. Like, okay, so there, you know, the one player was an innocent, but he was a thief. So he put those two things together. He's like, okay, I'm an innocent thief. So what was I? Right, what was I? And he kind of went through, oh, okay, I guess I, what if I were, um, you know, what if I were more of a, a noble? Okay, so he's sort of like a noble 
uh, innocent kind of a, you know, he's a maybe a bit of a fop or something like that who's been kind of wasting his life. He's a, in a, in a innocent, right, in that he's not a horrible person. He's not someone who was engaged with uh, the cult in any sort of bad way. Uh, but he was just sort of an innocent abroad, you know, living his merry life, doing fun partying stuff. And he got caught up, captured by this cult, and now he's like, all right, I'm going to do this. So he has sort of a, that going on. Um, and uh, and uh, the, the priest character, who, the, the, uh, the descendant, he picked the acolyte background, and so he was sort of like this wealthy... Um, oh, no, he, he picked the noble, actually. That's right, he picked the noble. But he put in his backstory that he was kind of at a monastery or something for a while, learning, to, training to be a, a monk or a religious or something like that. And then he was called back to his noble's land to kind of be take charge. And so he kind of has this desire for the religious life, but he's also now lived as a noble, and so he perhaps has a little bit of that decadence and that pull that direction. And so that's an interesting kind of like which way to go with his character. And he's a great role player. I think he'll play that up really, really well. Um, and I think the Beast picked like a a scout or, or something. Um, I forget which one he picked, but he's kind of a woodcutter <laughs> in his background. He's like the. It was like basically his his backstory was uh, uh, Little Red Riding Hood. That's what he came up with. <laughs> that he was had been a woodsman and he saved this girl from this creature, but it bit him and he took on the characteristics. All right, so that was sort of what we did in session zero, and then I gave them this document, which gave, gave them the new rules. Now the new rules here, I really want to cover pretty quickly because I think they're really cool as a combination with Shadow Dark, um, as a way of getting at the the setting of Curse of Strahd. Um, one of my problems with Curse of Strahd, which is, I think, my favorite of the 5e adventures, the 5e campaign books, um, at least the ones put up by Wizard. My problem with it is that the, the tone of the campaign is sort of at odds with 5e as a system. A 5e as a system is very superhero-y, right? There's nothing wrong with that. I love uh, me a good high fantasy superhero game. Um, it's great to you know wade into monster lairs and kill lots of monsters and have these big battles and get lots of hit points and, and you know not die very easily. I think that's really cool. You know, 5e is pretty lethal at low levels, but once you get past level 2 or 3, it's not terribly lethal, and uh, your power level can go up really, really high in 5e. And Strahd asks you pretty much to start out at level 3. I mean, if you're going to start out at level 1, you kind of have to do Death House or do something quick to get you to level 3, because you know, otherwise you're just kind of too weak to deal with anything. So... But, but again, well, my problem with that is once you're at level 3, then you're, you're starting to get really powerful as a character. And by the time you're level 5, you're really strong. I mean, when I played Curse of Strahd as a player, we challenged Strahd really early in the campaign. And, and partially this was because the DM wasn't the greatest in terms of managing his, his abilities and, and playing Strahd menacingly. But we, we basically killed him. The first time we challenged him outside of the castle, I mean, he turned into you know, mist and flew away. But it... Totally took the, the t <laughs> no pun intended, took the teeth out of that adventure. Because like, well, we already faced the end boss and we beat him. Yeah, granted, he got away, but you know, and he'll be harder when we face him in his lair. But okay, like, he, not he's not that scary. And I, I know that 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 was kind of a fluke that most DMs aren't going to let that happen to Strahd <laughs> right away. But it really has, I think, it's a possibility for the adventure because of the way Five E works. And then there's just issues with the way that fear works as a mechanic for a, a, a campaign that's supposed to be all about horror and terror and gloom and, and stress and these things. And there's no real mechanic for that in 5e. And uh, you can... Um, Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft added a, a significantly better system, but it's still not great. I wanted to add in sort of something else. Um, so I, I think Shadow Dark just fits way better in terms of its power to uh, danger ratio. It fits with a, a grittier gothic horror campaign than 5e does. So, that being said, I also thought that Shadow Dark's death rules are too brutal for a campaign where, um, where you, you, you are developing a story and you are certainly leaning more into the storytelling campaign than a dungeon crawl. Right? Curse of Strahd isn't really a dungeon crawl. I mean, Ravenloft is a bit of a dungeon. But aside from Ravenloft itself, you have a few small dungeons um, and a lot of role-playing and a lot of city crawling and a lot of, you know, investigation and stuff like that. And, um, and so I didn't want characters to stumble into a random encounter and die because they're Shadow Dark 
rules are pretty rough in that sense. Um, and that's totally fine. I love that for a, for a dungeon crawling campaign, for a West Marches campaign, for, for a, a, another kind of campaign. I don't think it fits for, for Strahd. But I also, again, as I just said, I don't like the, well, we're so strong, nothing will kill us, which is the opposite end of that spectrum, which is what 5e kind of falls into after level 3, 4, 5. So I changed Shadow Dark's hit point rules to match into the odd, or Cairn. Um, the first paragraph is just about how you get hit points when you level up, which is sort of a different way of doing it. I like it better. But um, the second and third paragraph there of that first section are all about... Um, that into the odd system. If you don't know it, essentially your hit points are your hit points as usual, but when they go to zero, you don't die or go unconscious immediately. Rather, additional damage or further damage is taken from your constitution. And when that happens, or each time that happens, your constitution goes down at all, you have to pass basically like a con check. I call that a shock test in my game. And if you pass it, it's a hard DC 15 con check. And if you pass that, you can just keep acting. You don't have to, st you don't go unconscious or, or anything. But if you fail that, you, you're incapacitated. And you don't go unconscious. I made that very clear to my players. You can maybe still speak, depending on the circumstances. Like, we'll figure it out uh, based on what incapacitated you. But you're not unconscious. You just can't act. Maybe you can sputter a few words or something like that. Or, or you know, you can yell for help or something like that. But you're not really able to act. Um, but if con is ever reduced to zero, then you just die outright. There's no death saves at that point. So constitution, your constitution is going to be going down as you keep engaging in battle. And during a rest, your hit points go fully uh, back up to full. So hit points are going to be going up and down and up and down, but your constitution is pretty much going to be dropping down until you get these chances to be really safe and rest for a while, a few days at least. And then your constitution will check chunk back up. Um, so essentially, that's your death timer. Your death timer is where your constitution is. I like that a lot better because it gives you much more choice about how to approach situations. If you're, you know, like like if you're at two constitution left, but you've got full hit points, you still have to be careful. Because, you know, even a short fall, so fall damage, poison damage, vampires, right? They all attack con directly. So you have to be much more careful about going into a fight with, say, an undead if you have low con, because it's going to skip your hit points. Or if you're going to be fighting on a, you know, a precarious place and you might fall even 20 feet or 30 feet and you're at one con or two con, like you're going to play your character differently. And I think that's really cool. Plus narratively it helps a lot because, you know, describing the scene, understanding the scene and, and narratively figuring out how do you get your hit points back after a short rest. Um, if your hit points are all that's going down, then you're not really getting hit yet. You haven't really taken damage. You're, you're getting winded. You're getting tired out. The situation's getting more dire. But when your hit points go to zero and your con starts to drop, then you're actually getting hurt. And so you can narrate that really easily. It's, it's, it's built into the system what to narrate. And then also, again, when you take a rest, your hit points go back to full, so you're ready to go, but you might be wounded. You might be injured still, and so you're going to play your character differently again because you have three con instead of full con. You're going to play your character differently. It's going to imitate, mimic that injury that you may have taken in the battle. All right, so that's the hit point rules that I'm doing. I think it's really cool. My experience rules are basically the Shadow Dark rules, but instead of uh, treasures and artifacts, I switched it to goals or achieving goals. So it's sort of like a um, it's sort of like a, a broken down um, milestone system. Instead of just getting one milestone and leveling up, you get XP for milestone equivalent stuff. So. Um, you'll notice that the levels are the same as Shadow Dark, trivial, normal, epic, and legendary, but the, uh, but the sort of descriptions of them are, are changed to achieving what you need to achieve. So trivial goals are those things that be trivial, right? That don't really, they don't really move you along in the story. They don't really count as success. They're kind of like a, a middle step in something. But you get an XP for anything that's, you know, good or useful or meaningful or relevant. And I'm, I'm erring on the side of being generous here. So if players are like, hey, that was pretty relevant, right? I mean, that was a useful thing to, for me to find or for me to get or to do. Yeah, you're right. Your party gets an XP for that. And it's the whole party gets that XP. So not just player by player. Um, and then there are three XP for epic goals, which are, you know, like those big moments when you're defeating the local bad, big bad or completing the side quest or completing even a sort of a major part of the main quest. And then there's the epic goals, which is beating the campaign or you know, doing the thing that's just totally legendary that you're going to talk about forever. That's like a 10 XP boost. And so that's how this, that's how this works.
I thought it felt a lot better than monster killing, because Strahd, Curse of Strahd isn't really built that way, and I didn't want to force characters down that way. And I think it's also better than treasure or carousing, because treasure and carousing, again, doesn't fit with the tone of what you're going for in Curse of Strahd. Initiative as well, I did side-based initiative, which is so much better for a number of reasons. Side-based initiative, um, chosen roller rolls a d6 each round. So it can jump back and forth. And then I also had this idea where if you tie, and I, I'm not the one who had this idea, other people had it, but I added it in. If you tie, then both sides act simultaneously. But uh, you have to declare actions in reverse order of wisdom. So it's kind of like you know perception, you know, seeing what, who's acting when and, and all that stuff. So low scores act first, or declare first, and then higher scores declare last. And then you all act together. And if there is ever a question of, hey, like order, sequence, like I run away, you're trying to catch me, who, who acts first, then you roll a dex check. And so normally combat's pretty fast because you have that side base bouncing back and forth, but then occasionally it slows down when both sides tie. And then you have that reverse order and it slows down and people have to be more strategic. I think that's cool. And then I have a stress system. Stress systems um, are basically... Um, I think it's a better way of doing terror than just having like, okay, your characters, you know, then nudging the characters to roleplay their characters as if they're afraid. Because that's hard to do. And it's hard for players to know how far to go and what to do and like how to, like, you know, if a player's like, I would be terrified by this, I'm going to run away, my character would do that. And someone else is like, yeah, but that kind of screws us over as a party that you just run away. Um, your roleplaying has killed my character. And, and yeah, that's something to be said for that. That could be cool, but I didn't want that to be the kind of the standard. So rather you have this, uh, a metric of how, how stressed out and terrified you should be playing your character. Right? It's sort of a metric, a, help, a helpful tool for your characters. As your stress goes up, you're probably going to get more and more as a good role player, which a lot of my players are. Uh, they're good role players. They're going to be playing that up, hopefully. So if your stress ever reaches your wisdom score, you just minus one to all mental checks, you're stressed. But if stress ever reaches two times your, your wisdom score, you can become terrified. And that is where you have to make a big decision. I didn't want terror to just like make you run or make you freeze or something like that. I wanted you to be able to choose. So I gave three options. You, when that happens, when you fail that check, then you can choose your character. Your, you as a player can choose what happens to your character. They fight, they, they, they flee, or they freeze, right? Fight, flight, or freeze. Um, if they fight, you just take an additional bunch of stress, but you can keep acting. Uh, fly, uh, flight, running away, is you heal a little stress, but you have to run away for d6 rounds. And then freeze is you don't have to choose. You just don't get to act this round. And next round, you get to roll again. And, if, and again, you can choose the same thing, fight, flight, or freeze that round too. And so you can kind of hold off and not act um, if you think you can pass that wisdom check and if it's worth passing that wisdom check. Um, and then there's, uh, you know, once it's at that point, every time you get stressed out, that you have to make the check. And then if you pass it, what I wanted was you kind of have this moment of success. So you reduce stress. If you pass that DC 15, you, you heal a little bit and you gain advantage against terror tricks triggered by that source in the future. You have to keep note of that. And I think that's really cool. So um, you can kind of overcome a particular fear and then you, you're not going to get as terrified of that in the future. You're going to resist the terror checks when that thing triggers your, your, your stress in the future. And then if it ever reaches three times your wisdom score, then you suffer a breakdown. You reduce the zero hit points immediately from whatever your hit points are at, and you become incapacitated. And the you know the DM work with work with the, me <laughs> to kind of develop new character quirks and traits. Now you can reduce that stress in the ways that I already mentioned by succeeding the terror check or by running uh, when you're terrified or when you rest. You get a D4 after each rest, and if you're doing it somewhere safe, it's a D6 instead. And then if you do some act relaxing activity or a significant amount of time doing something that you that you enjoy doing or like that, that's considered relaxing, then you get a D6. And you've got to work with the DM on that one. And then finally, I gave this, I thought it was a cool rule. Once per character per campaign, you have a moment of resolve. And you describe what, what brings that moment out, about as a player, but then immediately your character stress is reduced to zero. So like just you can choose to kind of have a nuke on your stress once per campaign. And I thought that would be really cool because it's like a you know, super cool moment to role play and to remember. Yeah, I remember when you used that moment of resolve and it was great because then you ran back in to help your friends. Something like that. And then I have some, you know, I got rid of magical mishaps because I didn't want wizards blowing themselves up with a mishap uh, right away, but no one picked a wizard. And then I did a different character generation because I didn't want it to be as kind of stuck as you are with um, Shadow Dark Raw. 
So that is uh, the background of my campaign. That's sort of what the rules I'll be using for it. Um, next video, I'll be talking more about our first session and then plans for the session going forward.